All right, folks, I know this is a long time coming. Somehow, I have not talked about Tuca and Birdie since season one, even though two additional seasons have been released since. Well, it's time to rectify that because honestly, TMB is pretty easily my favorite adult animated series of the last couple of years. If you aren't caught up, season one is on Netflix and seasons two and three are on HBO Max. Please give the show a watch. It is genuinely excellent. I think what stands out the absolute most about Tuca and Birdie is the way it portrays the characters' relationships. While the show is big and loud and fun on the surface, the ways it explores these characters and their relationships are actually incredibly nuanced. And the journey I find most interesting is Tuka's, especially in the way she navigates both her friendships and particularly her love life, and the evolution she undergoes throughout these three excellent seasons of television. Today we're going to do a deep dive on Tuka and the nuances of her relationships. Damn, Birdie! But first, let's talk about today's video sponsor, Babbel. I don't think learning language has ever been made any easier than with the apps and tools made available with Babbel. I have Italian ancestry, and I've actually been recently looking into Italian citizenship through that ancestry. So I've been doing Italian lessons via Babbel, which is such a great and versatile tool for learning language. And as you might expect, they start you off with the basics. Grazie. Grazie, signor Rossi. But I think one of their most useful types of lessons are the ones that help your listening comprehension in another language by playing a phrase for you and making sure you understand the verbs and key words. Noi siamo di Milano. The lessons are as short as 10 minutes apiece and can easily be integrated into even the busiest schedules. Babbel is so impressive in how they teach you, too. They have lessons, podcasts, games, videos, all to help aid people with different learning styles. If you sign up with the link in the description, you can get 60% off your subscription to Babbel. Once again, if you use the link in the description of this video, you'll get 60% off of your subscription and can begin your language journey today. The core of Tuca and Birdie is unsurprisingly the friendship between those titular characters. Absolutely everything else the show explores blooms out from that connection. And while their friendship is real and beautiful, it definitely isn't perfect, which I guess is one of the things that makes it real and beautiful. Tuca and Birdie do have a bit of a codependency issue, and this is pretty thoroughly illustrated from the outset. The inciting incident of the pilot is that Tuca is moving out of her shared apartment with Birdie as Birdie's boyfriend Speckle moves in. Tuca ends up leaving a box of her stuff at Birdie's place place over and over again just to have an excuse to come back over, even though she just moved upstairs one floor. But Tuca doesn't even really seem to comprehend that this is a real life change and not something temporary. So this is really permanent? Well, I hope so. Why are you doing this to me? But there's a lot to Tuca's difficulty accepting these changes. Obviously, she and Birdie have been together for a long time. They lived together for six years, but we also learned that shortly before the premiere of the series, Tuca decided to get sober. Birdie is the most solid pillar in Tuca's life, and adjusting to not only the change entering sobriety, but the change of an entirely new apartment away from her closest confidant slash supporter, that scares her. So many aspects of Tuca's life start to change so fast, and those changes lead to less stability and a new routine. This has got to be difficult, especially for a recovering alcoholic. On top of that, Tuca has major insecurities in regards to abandonment due to the untimely death of her mother when she was very young. We didn't have a lot of money, but my mom was crafty and took good care of us. We all loved each other. It all kind of fell apart after she died. So not only did Tuka's mother die, but her entire life and relationships with her siblings fell apart after her death. This gives a lot of context to Tuka's fears in the wake of all of these new changes in her life. After her mother, Birdie has been the most consistent person in Tuka's life. The fear of losing Birdie is in turn triggering the trauma she felt when her life fell apart the first time after her mother died. And sadly, Tuka's Aunt Tallulah perpetuates these insecurities pretty thoroughly. Everyone is gonna leave you in the end. You can't depend on anyone, you know? They're all gonna leave you! Fortunately, in the wake of this abuse, and through her fears that she'll end up alone like her aunt, Speckle is a supportive and reassuring friend, even when he's wasted. No way, Tuggles. You have me and Birdie. We're family. Oh, thanks, dude. But despite this reassurance, we still see Tuca stress about the possibility that she's going to lose that little found family she has with Birdie and Speckle. When the pair of them start to consider the idea of buying a house together, Tuca takes it very personally due to that aforementioned fear of abandonment. And these insecurities, as well as her struggles to adjust to her newly sober lifestyle, all come into play in a big way in Tuca's dating life. 
Pretty early in the show, Tuca shows major interest in a guy who works at her local deli, but she's incredibly nervous. Birdie tries to hype her up and recounts all of her previous successful flirtations. Just hit him with that confident Tuca swagger. Just be that wild, impulsive, very scary at times Tuca. But what Birdie doesn't recognize is that all of these instances that she recounts were when Tuca was drunk. Now Tuca doesn't know how to be confident and flirtatious without the aid of alcohol. She tries to be wild and impulsive like Birdie suggests, but it all feels forced and unnatural. She shows up in a wild outfit with a parasol and a hiker's backpack and a huge floral hat. Though, over the course of the evening, Tuca does have moments of actual, natural Tuca impulsiveness. Caca! Caca! We're making noises now? And these are the moments where she and Deli Guy actually connect and have these sweet little moments together. But Tuca struggles to adjust and is still uncomfortable, often quickly ruining these moments with forced spontaneity. Yeah, we should go. It's time to go to the amusement park. I hope you like shoddy safety and barfing. And ultimately, she panics one too many times. She flashes her date, asks him if he wants to do it in a Ferris wheel, and then he calls her out on it. You've been acting crazy all night. I keep trying to roll with it and like talk to you, but you're all over the place. Tuca's adjusting to an entirely new version of herself. She has to experience these important human interactions and relationships in a way she's never had to before. She has to learn to be herself. But now, now I feel so exposed. I don't know how to be. And Tuca's journey of self-discovery alongside her abandonment issues ultimately are what make her next major relationship in season two so tumultuous. One of my favorite episodes in the entire series is season two, episode four, Nighttime Friends, where Tuca meets Kara, a nurse at the hospital where Tallulah is being treated. While Tuca and Kara definitely have chemistry, a lot of her interactions with Tuca start a little bit judgy though not unjustifiably. First, she sort of gives Tuca flack for giving her sick aunt alcohol at the hospital. I see that shit go down here all the time, just not usually that flagrantly. The next time they see each other, Kara shows Tuca the adorable newborn baby birds while throwing some shade at Tallulah as well. Uh, don't let her get to you. That's just how she is. She's a roast master. To me, these are valid criticisms of how Tuca is dealing with her aunt. She really just lets Tallulah walk all over her, and I think Kara was right to throw side eyes at Tuca about this. And Tuca actually appreciates and acknowledges these things and changes her behavior. And after this, the pair spend some actual quality time together, and their chemistry is apparent. In some ways, Kara helps Tuca come out of her shell. Sleep now, bluebird, tomorrow's brand new. You're not alone, bluebird, though lonely's the trend. The entire episode, Tuca is just riddled with insomnia. And by the end of the night, as Kara sings to her and runs her hand through her feathers, Tuca is finally able to fall asleep. It's all really sweet, and it does show their chemistry. Though, it does also show Tuca perhaps falling into a pattern we've seen before, codependence. This episode is a small sample size, but we can see how this might lead there. This person comforts Tuca in a way that actually calms her insomnia. And while that's really nice, we see that it sort of leads to her over-reliance on Kara in unhealthy ways later in their relationship. And there was one particular line in this episode that was an unabashed red flag, at least in the context of Tuca and Kara's relationship. You're right about my auntie. She's always dick me around. You'd think I'd know better by now. Yeah, but you love her anyways. And that's the nice thing about you. While on its own, the idea that loving someone through their faults isn't necessarily a bad thing, in this context, Tuca is loving somebody despite the way that person abuses and mistreats her. And as we'll see over the course of their relationship, this is something that Kara absolutely takes advantage of. Though I do think the early stages of Tuca and Kara's flirtation entering their eventual relationship really show how much Tuca has grown since the Deli Guy incident in season one. While texting and flirting with Kara, Tuca is unabashedly herself. She's able to have fun, flirtatious conversations without the aid of alcohol. And it actually goes well. Tuca has really come a long way since floundering through her date with Deli Guy, and it's cool to see such a clear progression. Her journey also super accurately captures the stress that can come with navigating a new crush like this. The excitement, the uncertainty of how exactly they're feeling about you, the anxiety when those three little text dots pop up and then disappear. Have you 
ever spent days texting someone without knowing if they're into you? And despite the uncertainty in mixed signals, the two eventually do hook up, and it's a pretty sweet start to their relationship. But things don't stay so sweet. As soon as we start to see the ins and outs of Tuka and Kara's relationship, it becomes pretty clear that it isn't a healthy one. It starts small, but we see how Kara ignores Tuka's suggestions and desires. I saw a weird sock a few blocks down. It might still be there if you want to poke it with a stick. Hmm. Want to go somewhere really cool? On top of this, she doesn't really acknowledge when she does something hurtful towards Tuka, instead putting the blame on Tuka herself for feeling the way she does. Seriously, who raised you? That kind of hurts my feelings. I'm just joking. You're so sensitive. And when Tuka makes her own plans to hang with Birdie, Kara just fully guilt trips Tuka into feeling bad about not hanging out with her anymore. It's cool that I'm going to this show with Birdie, right? You already said yes, so what does it matter? It's very clear that the way Kara is treating Tuka is unhealthy and manipulative, but Tuka's lack of relationship experience and previous traumas make this difficult for her to get a handle on. She tries to express her concerns to Birdie, but without all of the facts, Birdie tells Tuka that relationships are all about compromise. This, combined with Tuka's traumas related to fear of abandonment, end up taking her down a very un-Tuka path, where she prioritizes others' desires and the stability of the relationship over her own feelings and sense of self. Kara's apology about the way she treated Tuka was completely hollow. She didn't acknowledge what she did wrong. All she says is, Hey, um, that was weird before. I don't want things to be weird between us. And when Tuka tries to talk further about it, Kara just straight up ignores her. And unfortunately, Tuka lets it slide because she now thinks this is something she has to compromise about, and her codependent tendencies prevent her from wanting to cause conflict that might lead to losing Kara. And after this, we see Tuka change into someone that she just genuinely is not. There she is, wearing pants? <laughs> She compromises her entire sense of self on every level to placate Kara. She dresses differently, acts differently. Everything she does is unrecognizable from the person she was, all for Kara. Tuka, you're early. Kara says being early is on time, and being on time is late. Birdie brings up something incredibly important here. She sees all of the ways that Tuka has changed herself for Kara, and she asks a really big question. Just tell me, is she changing for you? Or is it all one-sided? And this is exactly the primary issue here. Kara is not interested in compromising for Tuka. She just wants Tuka to integrate into her life. Even asking Kara to do something as simple as riding a Ferris wheel is like pulling teeth. Let's ride the Ferris wheel. Uh. And the issue is absolutely gorgeously illustrated in a stylized dancing sequence that takes place in Tuka's head. It's honestly one of my favorite things I've ever seen animated. We see Tuka meet Kara, and Kara starts to dance for Tuka. Then, as Tuka starts to dance for Kara, Kara stands there looking impatient and unimpressed. She grabs Tuka by the hand, and the pair start to dance Kara's dance together. And Tuka shrinks. She can't be herself, and it makes her feel small. Then, in comes Birdie, and she and Tuka dance perfectly in sync. They allow each other to be themselves. They hype each other up. They embrace each other. Until Tuka is once again grabbed and swallowed by Kara. Tuka is literally afraid to be herself around Kara because it's going to strain their relationship, because she fears being abandoned and rejected by her. Look, I'm usually too much for people, so if I can make myself not be too much, then maybe Kara will keep liking me. And now we see, for the first real time, Tuka attempting to put her foot down and establish an actual boundary with Kara. She firmly tells Kara that her feelings were hurt by the way she acted all day, and that it isn't fair that they always do what Kara wants to do. Tuka never gets to be herself or take the lead. I'm not asking for much. Just dance to my rhythm once in a while. And even though Tuka does the right thing here, Kara is too stubborn and set in her ways at this point. She says she hears Tuka and that she'll make an effort, but instead, she ghosts her. After weeks of being together, spending all of their free time one on one, Kara straight up ghosts Tuka. Why aren't you talking to me? Just give me one word! One word! 
And this could have been an absolutely major setback for Tuca, given her trauma with her mother's death and subsequent fear of abandonment. This is exactly the kind of thing that Tuca feared, her biggest insecurities fully realized. That is one of the most difficult feelings in the world. But luckily, with Birdie's help, Tuca actually overcomes these feelings. And in season three, we see how the struggles and lessons from her relationship with Kara helped propel Tuca into a significantly healthier place. And we even see it in action in her newfound relationship with Figgy. There's a bit of a time jump between season two and three, but when we catch up with Tuca, she's generally doing really well. She's holding down a job for the first time, and she's already started a relationship with someone new, Figgy, whom she met at a sexual harassment seminar, ironically. I wanna climb up you and eat all your fruit and build a tree house in your head. Ooh. And for the most part, they have a really nice, healthy relationship. Early on, Figgy suggests they take an impromptu trip to Horseville, and he cites the suggestion as his attempt to be more fun and impulsive like she is. He's really trying to meet Tuca on her level level unlike Kara, and he's even incredibly considerate about the things he's said to her. Granted, in this scene, Figgy is actually talking to Speckle, disguised as Tuca, but this is still a great example of Figgy being very considerate of how he comes across to Tuca. Hey, that thing I said earlier about you being the first non-plant I've dated, I feel like that came out sounding wrong. Throughout this episode, Tuca is afraid to tell Figgy about some chronic pain she feels when she gets her period, and explain how it makes her really depressed every month, something that I think once again stems from that insecurity and fear of abandonment. Obviously, Figgy is her partner, he should know these things, but she doesn't want to scare him off. But Figgy is much more accommodating and responsive. I like all of you every part of you put together, no matter whether those parts are feeling good or bad. Honestly, Figgy directly addresses Tuca's fears and insecurities in such a firm and considerate way. It's actually really impressive. Like, this is probably the best thing she could have heard from a significant other, given what happened with Kara. I like caring for other people, you know? It makes me feel good. So don't worry about being too much for me. But the other thing I don't think Tuca ever expected was that maybe Figgy might be too much for her. And there was one very important sticking point in their relationship. Tuca is sober, and though Figgy was upfront and honest about it, he's somebody who likes to drink a lot. He tells her that he drinks a lot, and initially, Tuca seems okay with this. She opts to set up some ground rules instead, the big two being she doesn't want him to drink in front of her, and she doesn't want him to drink so much that she has to take him to the hospital. Figgy only has one single rule for Tuca. Don't ask me to stop drinking. I love you, but I know myself. And I'm not going to change. Overall, all of this is really great communication. These two love and respect each other, and it shows in how they talk through their own issues and insecurities. But I think that Tuca really underestimated how difficult this would be for her. It isn't long after this that Tuca actually gives in to one of her rules, and of her own volition as well. She encourages Viggy to have a special cocktail at their restaurant. Oh, and yeah, she was eaten by a snake in this scene. Just ignore that. But it becomes clear to Tuca how difficult this is going to be when she stops by his apartment later and finds him just incredibly plastered, basically incoherent, leaves falling off of his branches. And Tuca does something that I don't think she would have been able to do with or before Kara. Tuca initiates a breakup with Figgy because she recognizes that this is not a healthy scenario for either her or Figgy. I can't care about you and know that you're hurting yourself. I just can't. I'm sorry. Even though it's so difficult for her, even though it means losing the person she cares about, one of her biggest fears and insecurities, Tuca makes the hardest choice and sets an important boundary. She can't be with Figgy if he isn't willing to take care of himself with his drinking. Even though he is such a good, considerate partner and they both have healthy communication styles and a good, strong relationship, something that she and Kara never had on any level, she still makes the tough decision to end things. And that is major growth for Tuca. And and it's not as though she just moves on either. Tuca still struggles with this decision and grapples with her fears for Figgy even after they split. She has this very vivid daydream where she sees Figgy and the fruit of his figs are rotten and filled with maggots. Then Figgy's face becomes worn and zombie-like, illustrating her fears for his well-being. Tuca and Figgy eventually run into each other sometime later at a doctor's office and Figgy reveals that he has root rot and hasn't been drinking because of it, even seeking Tuca's advice for sobriety. But then he also says that it doesn't matter and he's just going to go back 
back to normal after he's healed. To which Tuga says something vitally important in her own growth. She firmly maintains that boundary she set, and she tells Figgy how it makes her feel. It does matter, and it's really selfish of you to not take care of yourself. Now let's juxtapose this to when Tuka stood up to Kara in the dance. Kara pretended to be accommodating, but immediately ghosted Tuka. This must have made it so difficult for Tuka to be willing to stand her ground in these kinds of situations. But she did the right thing, and it paid off, because Figgy is actually responsive to what she said. You're right. I'm sorry. It's me, Figgy. And after this, Tuka still maintains the boundary she set. She reestablishes their friendship, and they even go to a wedding as platonic dates. A wedding where she happens to see Kara. The two of them help each other through these tough situations as friends, Tuka dealing with seeing Kara and Figgy warding off the temptation to drink. And ultimately, they realize that their connection isn't something they can just ignore. That they're the type of couple who can help each other through even their most difficult struggles. I want you. The thought of being with you is the only thing getting me through tonight. I want you too. There's this really beautiful shot where Figgy looks out in the crowd and sees all of the alcohol glowing and tempting him. And he looks down at Tuca and he sees that same glow, but even brighter. There's a bit more with Figgy in the season three finale, but to me, this is the real climax of this journey for Tuka and her relationships. Tuka's journey is just so beautiful and clear. We fully understand her biggest fears, insecurities, and struggles in her life. In season one, we see how those things make it difficult for her to find herself in her dating life. In season two, we see her make forward strides, but those insecurities prevent her from establishing meaningful boundaries in her relationship. And then in season three, we see just how much she's learned from all of those struggles. She clearly and openly communicates, she sets clear boundaries, and she's met with a stronger and more meaningful connection because of it. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this Tuka and Birdie essay. I love this show. I think I want to do a video on Speckle and another on Birdie at some point. Let me know if that's something you're interested in or if there are any other ideas from this series that you want me to explore. Thanks again for tuning in and stay tuned for more. Peace. Johnny! Johnny!